Hello, I'm Lisa Hughes, at News 1130's legislative reporter. And you and I will be having some face time with the leaders of BC's three leading political parties. One at a time, they're going to be fielding questions from reporters at News 1130, City News, Breakfast Television, and Omni. They're hearing questions in their communities that matter to people in Metro Vancouver, voters. Some of the questions that may not have been asked yet or answered yet. And hopefully these conversations will give you a better insight into each leader and what a vote for their party means to you. First up, we have Sonia Firstnow, leader of the BC Greens. Sonia, thank you for joining us. Hi, Lisa. It's great to be here. So we're going to dive right in with a question from Arvin at Omni. He's looking at what can be done to help people who move here to Canada be able to for, perform their professions here in Canada more easily. If elected, what can your government do to increase the participation of immigrants who are licensed professionals in their home countries? It's a really great question. I'm so glad that Arvin asked it because it's something that we have to get to work on urgently. Uh, we have medical doctors, teachers, professional engineers uh, coming from other countries and they aren't able to contribute and work and be part of the fabric uh, and bring their skills to BC. So it is, uh, it is something that we absolutely need to work on. We've identified this in our platform, particularly around doctors. Uh, but it is uh, absolutely essential that we, we ensure that people who are trained and professional can be here in BC working and, and providing their expertise. I wonder if you could touch on what specifically might be done, because it's not just doctors. I think looking at long-term care right now, it's something that's vitally important to have people who are nurses and care aides working. So what are some things that can be done to speed up this process? Well, it is just that. It's, ad it's identifying that the outcome we want to get to is to get people working as quickly as possible, looking at where in the process we're having the delays and, and getting rid of those delays. Uh, we have to be uh, ensuring that people have the skills and the expertise, but, but once that's assured, they should be able to work in BC. And will that take some work with the colleges to make sure that can happen? Yeah, and with the health regulation reforms that we've uh, proposed, Adrian and Adrian Dix and Norm Letnick and I, that can be part of the streamlining of those kinds of processes in the colleges. I know it, it also affects teachers, and we, we need highly qualified teachers as well. Uh, and, and again, it's that streamlining. Once you've identified that this is an outcome you want to get, and this is the important part, is political will. Uh, we haven't had the political will to really make this uh, an urgent issue. We need it now and we need to move forward as quickly as we can. Changing track just a little bit, and this was an issue that ended up being a hot button in the debate, looking at racism, and this is Bowen from Omni asking the question. If you elected, how will you deal with systemic racism? How will you protect Chinese community from racism? Uh, it's it's really uh, one of the most important questions of our time right now because we have seen examples of systemic racism. We also know that people in BC, if they're black, indigenous, people of color, uh, experience racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and we need to fix that. So what we are proposing uh, right away is to ensure that there is anti-racism education for every K-12 student every year because it's education that really is essential to ensuring that we become an anti-racist society. We would get the Police Act uh, review that was underway and canceled because of the election. We would get that back up and running. We would work with Indigenous communities, with Chinese community, with South Asian community, with people of color, the Black community, to ensure that we are moving forward on this with the urgency, again, that it, it deserves. Um, I think that it's, it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, Racism is experienced by people of color in this province, uh, and we have to get very serious about addressing that so, so urgently. And I think you've touched on this a bit, but we have Isabel with City News asking a little bit more detail about that last question. Many people voiced their disappointment with the answers given Tuesday when it came to racism. One UBC expert said it's not enough that our government leaders uh, say that they are not racist. They need to be anti-racist. So we want to know what are some concrete ways that you and your government are going to be anti-racist? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think we have to really recognize we need to be anti-racist as leaders, as government, uh, in our society. 
we have systemic racism in, in many of our, our government services, and Ministry of Children and Families is one where we see the impacts of systemic racism, the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care. We need to address that. Uh, again, the education piece in our school system is essential. Passing the, uh, you know, declaring the UN decade for people of African descent would bring services and funding to be able to do anti-racism work in our province. Horgan was asked to do that in 2017. He didn't do it. We would move forward with that urgently. Uh, and just recognizing that because systemic racism, the nature of it is that it is, it is invisibly in many ways existing in so many of government services and how we order society. We have to become very, very clear about how that plays out in people's lives and how we're going to change the system so that it stops. And I'm wondering, you know, if, if you don't form power, and it, let's be honest, it looks unlikely, and that you may not have the same kind of um, sway that you had these last three and a half years, what pressure can you put on to make pro projects like getting anti-racist programs in schools happen quickly? Do you think that there's yeah. an openness from whoever forms government to do that? I would hope so, and I think that that's what I've been advocating for uh, all along, is that we should be listening more to each other, recognizing that each party brings different perspectives, different ideas. And when another party has a good idea, uh, let's move forward with that. And we've seen that kind of collaboration happening, and we see that it actually results in outcomes more rapidly and gets things moving. Uh, you know, this is what has to happen. I, I will point to that before I was even ever an MLA, uh, we successfully got the provincial government to cancel a permit here in Shawnigan for a contaminated landfill. So I'll bring all my skills and resources, no matter what the outcome of the election, to ensure that we're moving forward with the very best policy for British Columbians. And anti-racism policy has to be something that we urgently recognize as needed in this province. And one thing you've talked about is that this is the hardest time that we're going through, and many people looking at how we're going to get past it and, and what happens next. And we have Travis with uh, City News with a question about that. Many British Columbians are waiting with bated breath for a COVID vaccine. If and when a vaccine is developed, how will you ensure people in all corners of the province get quick access to it? Yeah, um, well, we, that absolutely has to be a priority. I know that the other two parties have said, you know, as a campaign promise, we'll make it free. Of course it will be free. This is a public health emergency. Uh, the vaccine would be available uh, to everybody in this province. And we would have to work with our public health officers around the region to ensure that it's distributed as quickly and efficiently as possible. Look at existing institutions that can be delivering it and being prepared for when that vaccine is available, that we can get it. Uh, out to people as quickly as possible and absolutely in every region of the province. And now from one health crisis to another, here's David with City News. BC's other pandemic is the opioid crisis. More than 5,000 people have died from an illicit drug overdose in this province since the public health emergency was declared in 2016. It's a problem hitting every corner of our society from people on the street to people dying in their own homes. And the monthly death toll numbers just came to seep getting worse. What will your party do to bring the overdose crisis under control? Just as we followed Dr. Henry's advice on how to deal with COVID-19 and the global pandemic, we should also be following her advice and the advice of experts on how to deal with the overdose pandemic, which is a public health emergency. It has been for four years. And so what Dr. Henry and other ex experts have indicated, we need to decriminalize small uh, amounts of drugs, stop treating this like a criminal issue, treat it like a health issue. We need to have a safe supply so people are not dying from a toxic drug supply. We need to have low barrier access to support, to treatment in communities. So many communities in BC do not have access to treatment and supports in communities. And we know that when people go to a different community and then return home, uh, that treatment tends to be far less successful. We need mental health care. This is why we've proposed to have mental health care uh, incorporated into our public health system delivery so that people can get access to preventative mental health care before things get out of control. And we need to have more counseling available in schools. There's, we have to look at both ends of this. The, the urgent crisis we're in, that's the safe supply, the decriminalization, getting treatment, but also how do we prevent uh, people finding themselves in these places of crisis? 
And sort of that comes out of that question with mental health and addiction is people who don't have a place to live. We see mm -hmm. it in Vancouver, in Strathcona Park, and it's a struggle. People want people to be cared for, but they also don't want tent cities in their neighborhoods. What do you suggest is the solution for trying to help people get into homes? Yeah, again, looking at the evidence, so communities and regions that have adopted a, a housing first model, recognizing that people cannot have stability and certainty in their lives if they don't know where they're going to be sleeping at night. I think we can all recognize how, uh, what an impact that has on people living without homes. So adopting a housing first strategy, recognizing that uh, we have to have a kind of a a conveyor belt system where at first there's a lot of supports for people, they're getting access to the health care, to the treatment they need, uh, and then moving more and more along that uh, that sort of trajectory uh, ultimately to independent living. But it costs more to all of us to have people living without homes. And we have to, again, look at the evidence, look at the best practices, look at what research tells us about how much more effective it is to ensure that people can start with that foundational need being met of having a place to sleep and live that is safe and secure and certain. But heading into the winter of COVID, there are people in tents right now. So building, you know, from the ground up is great, but that's not immediate. So what would you do in the immediate? And is there money, you know, if you had government in the budget to do it? You know, there, there's solutions that are that can be very quick. Here in Cowichan, we saw examples where uh, BC Housing was able to uh, purchase hotel space uh, and provide that that supported housing for people that really turned their lives around. We can look at modulars, which can be really brought in in a very quick turnaround. And it doesn't mean that every that the modulars are all in one place. We can distribute them so we don't have these large uh, sort of uh, realms of people, uh, and they have to come with the supports. So it, it's recognizing, like as we did during the early months of COVID-19, that we had to move very urgently to get housing for people, working with the local communities, working with local governments, uh, listening to the, the knowledge and wisdom that they have about their communities, where the best locations are, what are the opportunities. And again, having that urgency, that political will to say, this is not a winter when we can have you know, potentially the second wave of COVID-19 hitting us and met far, far, far too many people living without homes. Uh, we have to feel that urgency and then act on it so that people have a safe place to sleep over this, this winter. Now, going from where we live to how we get around, we go to a question from Sonia, for, Sonia you're Sonia first to know, from Sonia know. with News 1130. <laughs> Many Metro Vancouverites have no choice but to commute every day. We don't have a replacement for the Massey Tunnel. The new Patello Bridge is still years away. And the idea of a third North Shore crossing seems like a dream. So what is your plan to give commuters more options and to be more proactive about infrastructure projects? Yeah, it's such an important question. and and. Number one is working with the, the local governments, working with the mayor's council that have put a strategy forward for uh, how to address transportation and commuting needs, recognizing it's more efficient to move people uh, in public transit. I spent yesterday in Vancouver and I, I used the SkyTrain to get all over from Vancouver to New West to Surrey and then back to Vancouver. Uh, we need to recognize that our transportation solutions also have to be climate solutions. Uh, we have to stop separating the emergencies that we're facing because the, the other emergency we're facing is a climate emergency. And transportation accounts for a lot of our uh, emissions in this province. So recognizing the local governments, regional transportation projects and solutions exist, and we have to lean in to support those solutions as they are brought forward. And looking at getting around, this is an area where you have a kind of bold step back, whereas when in many other areas you're looking forward. BC Ferries, we go to a question from Travis. As COVID-19 forced British Columbians to go on staycations this year, many have realized traveling with BC Ferries is not cheap. How will you ensure BC Ferries doesn't increase its rates even further to cover losses from the pandemic? And so in our platform, we've indicated, as we did in 2017, to bring BC Ferries back as a Crown Corporation under the government of BC. It should not be a any kind of profit-driven 
uh, experience for or or uh, sort of infrastructure because it is part of our transportation network. There is no way to get to Vancouver Island uh, from the Lower Mainland without using BC ferries. So many communities in BC are ferry dependent, and it should be recognized as a service. Uh, not a profit-driven approach to things, and we would bring it back under the government as a crown corporation. And last question, looking at affordability, it's the, always the question du jour. Housing, we go to Ria with News 1130. Well, Vancouver has long been an unaffordable place to live, and with the COVID-19 pandemic, quite a few young people are losing their jobs or seeing reduced hours in the workplace, especially if you're in tourism or hospitality. So if you were voted into power, what would you do to make sure that young people can stay in the city? Yeah, we have a targeted plan for supporting renters, which in, which which focuses on anyone who's paying more than 30 percent of their income would see support from government to ensure that they're they're not paying more than that in their rent. So we know that 30 percent is that threshold of what's considered affordable. Uh, and our targeted plan really looks to support renters who are paying more than 30 percent of their income in rent. This is more effective than just a, a one-time cash giveaway to everybody, whether they need it or not, because it ensures that the people who need it the most are getting the support. And it's not dependent on any kind of, uh, uh, you know, knowledge or anything from the landlord. This is specifically between the renter and the government. If your income, uh, if your rental costs are more than 30 percent of your income, you would get support. We just have a couple minutes left, and so to lighten things up, because gosh knows there's not a lot of things that are light right now, what are you watching on TV or Netflix to ease your mind during this time? Well, I, I expect this might get some interest from some people, but uh, I, too, have been a longtime Star Trek aficionado. <laughs> I don't wear it uh, quite so boldly. Um, but I have very little free time. I have managed to watch a few episodes of the new Star Trek Picard. Uh, and what I like about it, it's about leadership. It's about caring about people. Uh, it's about, you know, how do we do better? And, uh, of course, it's about one hour in my day when I can be thinking about something other than an election campaign. <laughs> well, and with the election campaign, you've talked a lot about collaboration and working together. So in the spirit of kindness, can we finish off with you saying a kind word each about each of your competitors? Yeah, absolutely. I have, I have no trouble thinking of kind things to say. I've always found uh, working with Andrew Wilkinson, he is a very uh, thoughtful, kind person. I remember once in the, in the chamber, um, I had my question period time uh, rather rudely taken away from me, and he wrote me a note saying, you know, that was so unfair, and, and, and if you stand up in the next slot, we'll give you our slot for your question period so you can get your question answered. Um, and with John, of course, you know, we go back well before 2017. I met with him in 2015. He was uh, up here in Shawnigan, uh, you know, as part of our efforts to get the contaminated landfill permit cancelled in our community. Uh, but uh, uh, many people won't know this, but John Horgan and my husband went to high school together at Reynolds. Uh, so th there's a long, a long tie back uh, well, we're not going to say exactly how long ago, but a very no long time No one needs ago. to know. No one needs to know. <laughs> Sonia, thank you so much for your time. That's Sonia first to know with the BC Greens. Don't forget to go out to vote. And always, you can get the news you need to know about the election and everything else at citynews1130.com.